Good morning. We'll try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Now you can hear. Now you can hear me. <laughs> I think I'll back away from that a bit. Please turn to your confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us, let us pray. <laughs> I think it's my voice, but we'll move over. Let us pray. Holy God, your word feeds your people with life that is eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading of the day is from Joshua 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Sechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. <clears throat> and Joshua said to all the people, Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went and among all the peoples through, through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of the Lord. against those who do evil to erase the remembrance of them from the earth the righteous cry and the Lord hears them and delivers them from all their troubles the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from every one. God will keep safe all their bones. Not one of them shall be broken. Evil will bring death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. O oh Lord, you redeem the life of your servants, and those who put their trust in you will not be punished. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. <clears throat> the second reading is from Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always preserve in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known the boldness, the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of the Lord. The gospel for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost comes from John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Today, you have in front of you a translation, and is it the NRSV? Uh, It printed in front of you, but I would like to read the gospel today from the message. So as I read, you could follow along even in that translation because I think sometimes these translations complement each other and give us new insight. The Gospel. By eating, by eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you enter into me and I into you. In the, in the same way that the fully alive Father sent me here, and I live because of him, so the one who makes a meal of me lives because of me. This is the bread from heaven. Your ancestors ate bread and later died. Whoever eats this bread will live always. He said these things while teaching in the meeting place in Capernaum. Many among his disciples heard this and said, this is tough teaching, too tough to swallow. Jesus sensed that his disciples were having a hard time with this, and he said, Does this throw you completely? What would happen if you saw the Son of Man ascending to where he came from? The Spirit can make life. Sheer muscle and willpower don't make anything happen. Every word I've spoken to you is a spirit word, and so it is life-making. But some of you are resisting, refusing to have any part in this. Jesus knew from the start that there were that there weren't going to that some weren't going to risk themselves with him. He also knew who would betray him. And he went on to say, This is why I told you earlier that no one is capable of coming to me on his own. 
You get to me only as a gift from the Father. After this, a lot of his disciples left. They no longer wanted to be associated with him. Then Jesus gave the twelve their chance. Do you also want to leave? And Peter replied, Master, to whom would we go? You have the words of real life, eternal life. We've already committed ourselves confident that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Good morning. A little bit of good news today. I'm not going to talk to you about bread. <laughs> First time in a few weeks we haven't done that. Uh, something a little bit different today. Uh, years ago, and well, actually still, there were people who could sort of live alone and not really worry about the things that were going on in the world. Uh, the men could live in a place uh, where uh, they, they all lived together. They were monks. And then you had women who could live together, and they would be nuns. And they didn't have, and sometimes they didn't have a whole lot of contact with the outside world. They could sort of live in that place and, and worship and be with God and be very peaceful. Well, kids, you really don't have that choice, do you? You can't just stay in a, a, a little hole your whole time or stay in one room your whole life and just live like that. You have to go out into the world. You have to meet people. You have to experience ideas. And sometimes those things might be sort of against God's teachings, against what Jesus has taught you. They might be a little scary. Well, there was one re reading in the Bible today that's very, very descriptive. And it tells you to put on the armor of God. And it says, put on a breastplate, put on a belt. You've got a shield, you've got a sword. That makes it seem really, really scary, doesn't it? But the person who was writing and talking to us, they didn't really want to scare us. They wanted to reassure us. They wanted to reassure us that whenever we go out into the world, or, or whenever we're sort of close at home, if you're watching television, if you're listening to music, if you're you know, looking at something on the internet, if you're talking with people, if you're out here on the street, that sure, you're going to see things that are a little bit scary. But what the Bible's trying to tell us is that those scary things don't have to be so scary if we keep God with us. Simple message. The, the writer goes way overboard, makes it a little bit scary, but try not to be scared of that. Let's have a little prayer. Dear Lord, we know that in your world, there are things that can be scary and can be ungodly. We hope that you can keep us with you so that we might be safe and secure and unafraid. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm a little scared. <laughs> We're set now. Grace and peace to you from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I guess it's been, what, four weeks since I've been here with you all? It's been interesting how God works. I was given that opportunity to introduce to you the six chapter of the Gospel of John and what you would be hearing for those five weeks. And now today, it seems that I have the opportunity to add a summary to all of that you've heard about bread. One of my favorite things to do is to tell stories. I grew up hearing stories of all kinds, but I also love to tell them. Do you love a good story? Oh, who doesn't love a good story? One that keeps our interest, one that teaches us perhaps a greater truth, one that explains and informs our lives, 
one that provides opportunity for morals and our values to be clarified, and perhaps a story that is humorous or just funny. Who doesn't love a good story? And as I mentioned earlier, there are many different types of stories. Perhaps one of my favorite ones that I've heard my entire life are the stories that contain exaggerated or unbelievable parts. We call them the tall tale. Tall tales are told as if they were true, but you just knew they were pulling your leg. And usually these tall tales are exaggerations of real life events. History tells us that many started from the bragging contests that those tough American frontiersmen would start when they gathered around the evening fire. We know it as folk literature or American folk literature, and most of it comes from around the 1800s when courageous explorers had exciting adventures on their way westward. So usually the heroes of tall tales are taller and bigger and stronger than real people. There's Johnny Appleseed, whose dream was to produce as many apples that no one could ever go hungry. And he always carried his leather bag filled with apple seeds that he had collected from the cider mills. And the legend says he was constantly planting them in open places, in the forests, along the roadways, and by the streams. Personifying the frontier spirit of the American West, the legendary man Pecos Bill displayed superhuman feats that grew every time someone shared that story. As the legend goes, he was born in the 1830s, and Pecos Bill was the youngest of 18 children. God bless his mother. I can't imagine 18 children. But 18 children of a Texas pioneer, and that he was, according to tradition, tough as nails, that he used a bowie knife as a teething ring, and he made wild animals his playmates as a toddler. Another tall tale character of American folklore, of course, is Paul Bunyan, a lumberjack of gigantic proportions, along with his blue ox named, or his, yes, his, his blue ox named, what's the name? Babe, of course, his blue ox named Babe. Paul Bunyan is said to have created logging in the United States, that he created the Great Lakes to water Babe and, of course, we know there's not a shred of truth to it, but it does make for a great story. The Wild West had its share of tall tales as well. American pioneers and frontiers men and women. Martha Jane Cannery, known as Calamity Jane. Annie Oakley, born Phoebe Ann Mosey. Mosey. Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, those tall riflemen with broad shoulders, dressed in light brown buckskin clothes with an overcoat, with leather tassels and a cap made of raccoon pelts. They are the best known American folk heroes who represent our American expansion into the wild frontier. And they really were before the wild, wild west had cowboys. Now, if you want to know the difference between pioneers and frontiersmen, you need to take a few minutes and Google it. It's been an interesting research for me this week, for there is a distinction, but just not now during the sermon. Perhaps the most inspiring of folk heroes is the tall tale that comes from your very own state. Who is it? John Henry. Of course, John Henry. Mr. John Henry himself, in 1870, the CNO Railroad began building the Great Bend Tunnel, where the Greenbrier River makes a seven mile meander around Big Bend Mountain. And the story goes that John Henry was hired as a steel driver for the railroad, and that work was, uh, was difficult and dangerous. So the railroad decided to speed the process up with a steam drill, a new invention of its day. And it was said that the steam drill could drill faster than any man. And of course, the challenge was on, man against machine. And John Henry was known as the strongest and the fastest and the most powerful man working on the railroad. 
he went up against that steam drill and he proved that he could drill a hole through the rock further and faster than the steam drill could. And he drilled so hard and so fast that he drilled a 14-foot hole where the steel only drilled nine foot. And of course, it is in the annals of time, the ballad of John Henry tells how he beat that steam drill and later he died of exhaustion. So yes, tall tales have been a part of our life since the beginning of time. Think about the person who goes fishing and comes back without any fish. What do they say? I had one this big, but it got away. Or the hunter who says, you should have seen the size of that bear. Before the 1800s, we had Aesop. Aesop was a Greek slave in the late to mid 6th century before the Common Era. And his fables are the world's best known collection of morality tales, 725 in number, and they are largely a means of teaching a lesson or a moral. But that got me thinking this week, what's the difference between a tall tale, a fable, and a parable? So I did a little bit of research. A fable comes from the Latin fabula, a telling, and the emphasis there is put on the narrative is usually a tale about animals and it, who are personified and behave as though they are humans, a feature that isolates the fable from the ordinary folk tale, which, resembles, which it resembles is a moral, a rule of behavior that is woven into the story. So Jesus speaking in parables, what is a parable? from Greek parabole, meaning a setting beside, suggests that there's a juxtaposition that compares and contrasts. So like the fable, a parable tells a simple story, but parables generally show less interest in the story itself and more in the analogy that they draw between a particular instance of human behavior. Look at, for example, the Good Samaritan and the human behavior that the Good Samaritan be shows. According to Britannica, both parable and fable have their roots in preliterate oral cultures, stories told down through the traditions of folk wisdom. And their styles differ. Fables tend toward detailed, sharply observed realism, and it eventually goes into satire, while the simpler narrative surface of parables gives a somewhat mysterious tone and makes it especially useful for teaching spiritual values. But all fables and parables and tall tales really are about allegory. So allegory from Greek meaning allos or other speaking suggests there's a more expanded use of language. In the early Greek, the term allegory was never used but the idea of a hidden underlying meaning is indicated by the word hypnia, literally meaning the underthought, the underthought. And this term is used of the allegorical interpretations of Homer and others. So Reverend Bertrand Bubby, B-U-B-Y, in an article titled, titled, Does John Use Parables? says that John is the only evangelist who does not use the word parable, but rather he uses paramaya. The corresponding word for paramaya in the Old Testament is mashal, which is an overarching classification of proverbs, pictorial discourses, hidden sayings, aphorisms, ethical teachings, practical wisdom, and allegories. So, for the past five weeks, you have been hearing Jesus tell stories about bread. If I haven't bored you already, beginning with the feeding of the 5,000, the whole chapter has used bread as that extended metaphor to describe what it is that Jesus is offering and the relationship that Jesus wants us to have. Those who are following want miraculous signs, just like when he fed those 5,000, or when they see him healing others, 
So Jesus elaborates on who he is a bit more. He tells them he is the very bread of life, eternal life, and that they are not only welcome, but that they are invited to find eternal life in eating the bread that he offers. So Jesus' description of himself as the bread of life offended his listeners. And this was definitely not what most of those present wanted to hear. Because I think Jesus asked, does this offend you? And their simple answer was yes. So the crowd becomes disillusioned and walks away. Now the crowd does not walk away because they have not received the good news. Because indeed they have received the good news. They walk away because it is not what they expected. So Jesus uses tales, parables, stories that tell them where to find the best that life has to offer and where they can seek it, where they can receive it. That story being in order to have life and to have it abundantly, one receives the free gift that God offers. And of course, the free gift that God offers is Jesus, the Son, who died and gave us eternal life the one who gave his body and his blood freely, literally, and unconditionally. Yes, Jesus came to earth to give himself, to give us eternal life, to give his body and his blood, and we, the church, use the physical signs of body and blood to, to provide the sacrament to everyone. That's what God calls us to do as the church. Physical signs that enable us to see the truly miraculous, the, the ultimate gift that we can be given in this life. It is right about here where this story begins to fragment and to crumble. They think it's a tall tale. They just cannot accept that, it, that what he's saying, because it sounds absurd or far-fetched, and here, many decide they just cannot accept the tale any longer. Many times, we do not see the value of that gift either. We do not see how precious it is, and then we start placing our own demands or perhaps our own expectations on that gift. We say we need proof, we need evidence, we need it to believe such a tale. My theological training, I was taught this is what is called up religion. I first heard up and down religion from one of my professors at seminary, the Reverend Dr. Timothy Wangert, who was at the time the Ministerium of Pennsylvania Professor of Reformation History at the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Currently, he is now retired. But he states in one of his seminars, up religion implies that humans are in control of their relationship to God, that they are able to get to God through their own efforts, while down religion means God comes down to us in all the love that God can bring, all the way through taking human form and dying on the cross. And our only possible response to this is confession. I love you too. Hear that again. Our only possible response to God's love is confession. I love you too. Hard to believe, isn't it? Sounds like one of those tall tales. And I bet some of you are sitting there saying, hey, wait a minute. You mean I don't have to do anything to get into the kingdom of heaven? That's a hard one to swallow. Don't I have to be good enough or behave a certain way or do something or not do other things? That was where many of the disciples were at in this gospel for today. They wanted to choose him instead of him choosing them, choosing us. Up religion. <laughs> I've heard that over and over again in all my years. How many, many times have I heard, I need to claim Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Up religion says, it's on me. But if I need to do something, the sinner in me 
will always fail. It will be, in my life, down religion, where God comes to me and I confess. Yet that goes against every sense of life for us, for how we've been trained and how we've been taught to believe that unless something is proven to us, we are not going to believe it. Yet I will tell you, I stand here after all these years to say faith cannot be proven. Can you prove the wind? Just like the wind, faith can only be experienced. You can't prove the wind. My friends, we are not in control. It is not our choice whether we follow God or not. It is only for us to receive faith, the faith that God gives, and to confess. Jesus says, by eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you enter into me and I into you. Listen to a tale, my friends, one that is true. Jesus said, I love you this much, and he stretched out his hands, and he died. Master, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life, real life. Receive his love. Just confess, I love you too. Yes, this gospel may appear as if it is a tall tale, told to impress someone or to make someone look bigger than life. It is not a tale with exaggerated or unbelievable parts, for the good news is really and truly a gift of grace, a piece of bread and a cup of wine, that connects us so closely that we are permanently forever connected. Abide, an intransive verb meaning to remain stable or fixed in a state. So in eating of Jesus' body and blood, we become so connected that he abides in us. And I know I now see how this can be hard to hear. But how radical are you? Radical enough to stay and tell the world that Jesus abides in you even when the world and others leave? There is this underthought, this hidden, underlying, literal meaning to Jesus' words. And for the last five weeks, we have seen the fullness of Jesus being the bread of life. By eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you enter into me and I enter into you. And the same way that the fully alive Father sent me here and I live because of him, so the one who makes a meal of me lives because of me. This is the bread from heaven. I know a man who trusted his father so much that he gave his life for people he did not know, and yet he loved them completely even to giving his life, because he gave his life. Therefore, all of my life is a response to his love. Story? Sure. Tall tale? No way. Amen.
please join with me in, in let's try that again please join with me in professing our faith through the words of the apostles creed i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ god's only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead. On the third day, he, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all who have any need. God of courage, bless all leaders of your church. Make them ready to proclaim the gospel of peace and strengthen them to preach your loving word. Lord, in your mercy. God of creation, bless fields and orchards. Protect the land from drought and bring life-giving rain to support growth. Instruct your people in wise treatment of the world that you have provided for all of your creatures. Lord, in your mercy. God of community, bless all who seek justice between nations and peoples. Give guidance to bridge builders, heal divisions, and inspire cooperation in times of crisis, disaster, and war. Lord, in your mercy. God of compassion, bless all who are in any need. Accompany all who are lonely and feeling abandoned and remind them of your abiding presence. Accompany all who are persecuted and exploited and open us to their cries. Lord, in your mercy. God of change, bless our transitions. Guide all who, em who are embarking on new stages in life, such as a new job, a new school, or a new community. Sustain enduring friendships and kindle new relationships and interests. Lord, in your mercy. God of comfort, bless all who mourn the deaths of their beloved ones. We give you thanks for the saints who have gone before us. Renew our confidence in your promise of resurrection and life in the world to come. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God and those in our hearts that are known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Let us share a sign of that peace with one another. Thank you. 
Now I'm on. Okay. Let us pray together the words our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Most all of the announcements are in your bulletin this morning, so take a look at those and keep up with what's happening. There is one additional thing. Candy, Ruth would like me to say a big thank you to everyone who helped with the personal care kits for the, uh, the Friends Feeding Friends organization. Um, their, the generosity of this congregation just knows no bounds. Uh, our members... Membership is asked to donate far beyond our regular weekly offerings, and you will be richly rewarded. We still need a few items. Shampoo, hand towels, deodorant, and toothpaste are the items that we need right now desperately. Um, if you are able to help supply any of these items, your help would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Son and Holy Spirit, bless you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.